in the last mini lecture, what we kind of took a look at was the Constitutional Convention. And I wanted to set up for you how uh, we end up eventually with the, the Constitution that we, we do, and we saw that it came out of a series of debates. Originally, the desire was to merely amend the Articles of Confederation, or that Constitution that we had during the War for Independence, which we talked about a couple of lectures ago. Uh, and, and then we want to recognize now that our current constitution is a reaction to both the British system and to the Articles of Confederation. And so what we're going to begin with in this lecture is taking a look in depth at our own constitution. And this is a big deal. It's, it's important because every American citizen should have some kind of understanding about this document. They should know where in it some of the major features are found. And it and <clears throat> it's really not that long. It's a very short um, constitution. As a matter of fact, you can read the American Constitution, even if you're a slow reader, in one or two commercial breaks. It's not that long of a document, so don't think that we have some kind of arduous task in front of us. And I'm also going to point out to you, there will be a number of test questions and quiz questions um, that come from the Constitution, because we're going to be referring back to this section a number of times. So with that in mind, let's take a look. Now, the first thing we need to understand is that the order of the Constitution is important. And that is, is that the framers actually started with the things that they themselves thought were the most important and moved forward. And you can see this in the length as well. The early articles are going to be long. As a matter of fact, Article 1 is one of the longest in the entire Constitution. And it deals with the thing that most uh, members of Congress thought was key, and that's Congress. The framers considered Congress the most important of the branches and thought it would be the driving force for most of the thing that happens. Article 1, Section 1 establishes that there will be a Congress and that all legislative powers are going to be granted to this Congress. Article 1, Section 2 is going to set up the House of Representatives and it's going to establish the qualifications for, the, for, the, uh, for running for House. It's going to talk about population being the basis for the House's size. Uh, and it's going to give the House its only unique power, which is the power of impeachment. Article 1, Section 3 is going to deal with the Senate. And it's going to uh, uh, establish that each uh, state will get two sen uh, senators. We're going to get the length of terms, six years. As a matter of fact, we'll get the two years for the House in Section 2. And we'll see that it will get the power to judge impeachment cases. Now, when you take a look at both the um, tests or any constitution, you're going to see that we'll be using Roman numerals for the articles. And that's just the way it is in constitutions, and we'll see it the same way in tests. So you'll say if we were talking about Section 2, Article 1, you would see it written this way. And I point this out because if you're not overly familiar with Roman numerals, you may want to remind yourself about that at least so that you can count 1 um, to 10 in Roman numerals. <clears throat> Sections 4, 7, and 8 are also going to be really important for us, and we're going to focus on them a little bit. Article 1, Section 4 is going to give uh, election times for House and Senators 
a very interesting location. It will head to the states. States determine how a national elections work. So how do you vote for your Florida House member or your Florida senator? Florida sets the rules. Or if you're in Ohio, Ohio sets the rules, right? So whoever. Um, but it's the state that ends up setting the rules for how you're going to run. And this is, this is huge. I mean, it can have a giant impact, right? In 2000, you know, we had this, there was this punch hole ballot method uh, in Florida, which was highly criticized when it results in uh, the Bush v. Gore controversy about who's going to be the next president of the United States. Uh, growing up myself in uh, northern Kentucky, they've been using mechanical and uh, electronic ballots for as long as I can remember. As a matter of fact, the way you vote in Kentucky is you actually reach out and pull levers on a giant machine uh, and then press the big red vote button. And, right, and it, it both mechanically counted the vote and printed out a paper ballot automatically. And so as a little kid, I always wanted to vote for everybody. It was a lot of fun. Um, in Ohio, for years, you actually colored in giant blocks. So, you know, there'd be people's names, and there'd be this huge block here, and they'd actually give you some kind of crayon look at crown, and you would, you would, uh, you know, color that all in, and that would be your vote. So states set that voting, and we're going to see that is a big, big deal as we move along a little bit later on. Article 1, Section 7 is going to give us the basic bill-to-law path. So how are bills made? We're going to do this in detail um, in a later section on Congress, and we're going to go in deeper than just the basic, but this is the basic outline for that, as found in Article 1, uh, uh, Section 7. The other interesting thing that's found here is another unique House rule, uh, and that is, is that in Section 7, only the House can raise revenue, meaning change taxes. So if you have a bill that's going to increase taxes, then it has to originate in the House. Um, Article 1, Section 8, if you don't read any other part of the Constitution, now I encourage you actually, and, I, and I'll remind you here again, you should read the Constitution for this class, but for your own edification, everyone, everyone should read Article 1, Section 8. Because in Article 1, Section 8, this is where we're going to find the powers of Congress. And at the very end of the powers of Congress, uh, we're going to see a really important clause called the Necessary and Proper Clause. So basically, Article 1, Section 8 is this big list of things that Congress can do. Yes, 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 you know, you can raise money, you can do this, you can do that, you can declare war, you have power over interstate commerce. At the very end, it then says that Congress has all powers, quote, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. And that phrase is going to have a lot of importance over understanding what Congress can and can't do uh, even today. So that's a brief kind of overview of Article 1. What about Article 2? So Article 1 deals all about Congress. Article 2 deals all about the presidency. Um, and it's going to be a much shorter section. Uh, Article 2, Section 1 will deal with presidential power. Power will be vested in the president. We'll talk more about this vesting clause in our lectures on the presidency. Uh, Article 2, Section 1 will also give us the method of election for president, which is the Electoral College. This actually means you might not understand this yet, but we'll talk more about this as well. You do not, uh, you do not vote directly for the President of the United States. As a matter of fact, you vote indirectly for the people who will vote for the President of the United States, and we call this indirect method of election, the Electoral College, and it's found in Article 2, Section 1. Article 2, Section 2 is where you're going to find the primary powers of the Senate, I'm sorry, of the President, such things like the President is the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, 
this is a big deal because it means that the president who is the head of the military is always a civilian and always a civilian on purpose. Um, Article 2, Section 3 explains why television changes. It requires a State of the Union address. The President has to address this uh, Congress on a regular basis. Once upon a time, these were hand-delivered uh, as letters. Uh, today, that doesn't happen anymore. So you can see, much, much shorter. Article 2, not quite as big of a deal. Um, Article 3 is probably the shortest of all. Uh, so Article 1 deals with Congress. Article 2... I apologize for the interruption. <laughs> I did not mute the phone. Um, so Article 1 is about Congress. Article 2 is about presidency. And then Article 3, as we begin here is about the courts. And in many ways, Article 3 is kind of like a footnote. It's, it's tiny. Um, and it doesn't do a whole lot. As a matter of fact, Article 3, Section 1, uh, it establishes that there's going to be a Supreme Court. And Article uh, 3, Section 2 defines the jurisdiction of the court. And then the rest of it, it just says, Congress will figure it out. No joke. Uh, Congress was given the power to determine the rest of the structure for the American court system. The framers are kind of like, done, handing it off, let's pass the sucker. <laughs> you know, because the court was considered the weakest branch. The idea that it would be a major player in the American political system was not something that any of the framers thought was going to happen. Uh, so no one was really concerned with trying to, uh, to make it unique. So the, the framers, this is the document that ends up coming out of the Constitutional Convention. But it doesn't just automatically go into effect. It has to end up getting ratified. It has to get passed. Ratified just means the Constitution is going to get passed and become the usable Constitution of the United States. And it's not really a foregone conclusion. And pretty quickly, two main groups emerge around this Constitution that we just went over, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists were for the Constitution, and the Anti-Federalists are against the Constitution. <clears throat> and they have a huge battle. Uh, now, just so you know, these, this name, Federalists and Anti-Federalists, we're actually going to read some of the articles by these guys. And they don't actually refer to themselves this way. Federalists call themselves... I'm Federalist for sure, but actually Anti-Federalist called themselves Federalist as well. The name Anti-Federalist comes from the Federalist, and kind of as you've always heard, the winners write history, and so this is what we get to. But you're not going to see Anti-Federalists referring to themselves as Anti-Federalists. These two sides are going to duke it out, and they're going to duke it out all over uh, the news and in newspapers, and they're going to duke it out in the ratifying conventions all around uh, uh, the country at the time. And some of this battle is going to end up becoming quickly a compiled work. As a matter of fact, in New York, there will be a series of newspaper articles written by some very prominent Federalists, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. And collectively, all of these uh, uh, papers will be known as the Federalist Papers, and they'll be collected today, and you're actually going to read some of them. Now, let me switch gears from talking about the Federalist Papers and all of this for just a moment and talk to you a, a little bit about Article 7 of the Constitution, right? Now, picture for a minute, I come into class and I have a, I have a syllabi, and I hand this out on the first day of class, and the very last clause in the syllabus says that I won't change the syllabus unless every student, every single one, agrees to the change. 
And everybody kind of thinks, that's pretty cool. I like this guy. He's doing cool stuff. And so I, uh, I you know, we have that and we use that. And it says we're going to have, you know, three tests during the course of the semester. And that's it. That's what we're going to do. Tests and quizzes. The end. So, you know, the midterm rolls around, you've had a few, ta you've had a few quizzes, uh, you have your first big test, and I say, hey, everybody, I've had this big revelation, I think you should all be writing papers. And some of you go, oh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be a lot better. You know, we would have to have the same kind of stress for a test. And then others be going, no, 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 I like prepping for the test, that's how I best learn. Other people are going to have vested interest, right? The people who've already done poorly on the desk may be going, yeah, yeah, let's change the, you know, because we don't, they don't want their bad grades to remain. And other people are saying, no, 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 I had good grades on the test. I don't want those to go away and have to do something entirely new. And I said, look, don't worry. I'm going to let you guys decide. Um, here's the new, here's the new syllabi. Uh, you decide hey, if we're going to go to it or not. And the way we're going to decide is um, if two-thirds of you agree then we'll move to the new syllabus and we take a vote and boom, you know, that'll be it. So we take a vote and it passes. Now, those of you who didn't want to happen, you pause for a minute and you're like, wait a second, wait a second. The, the syllabus says everybody has to agree. And I say, yeah, it's true, but look at the new syllabus. The new syllabus says I just need two thirds. Article 7 is a bizarre article in the Constitution because what it does is it sets up the rules for its own adoption. And it makes it a whole lot easier because it says it only needs 9 of the 13 states in order to go into effect. Or I should say 9 of the 13 colonies. Now think about that for a second. The unratified Constitution is the document that set out the terms for ratification. This is bizarre, and it's probably a political rule that you might want to remember. Right? If the rules don't work so well, write your own rules. <laughs> um, so the Federalists are actually going to have the upper hand as the result of Article 7 of the American Constitution. Now, but who are these guys for the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists? Well, let's talk about who they were, what they believed, and the systems of government they favored, and their leaders, right? Um, Federalists were generally the property owners. They were the guys who had money. Kind of the quick way of summing that up. Um, they were in the better positions of power. Anti-Federalists, on the other hand, were primarily frontiersmen. They were small farmers, meaning no slaves mainly. Um, and they were the ones who kind of lacked kind of the real capital. Now, both sides had very different feelings about who and how should believe. Federalists thought that elites were the individuals who should govern, while anti-Federalists thought that the people governing should be as close to the people as possible. All right, so you can't get much dip more different than right, an elite versus as close as possible. Because of these beliefs, the system of government that they favor is very different. Elites wanted a very strong national government, or excuse me, Federalists wanted a strong national government because that's where they thought elites would end up living. Um, but anti-Federalists wanted state governments to retain the, uh, the body of power because that was the closest to the people. Who were the leaders? You're probably very familiar with the Federalist leaders, at least their names. Hamilton, Madison, who hasn't heard of George Washington? You may or may not be as familiar with the leaders of the Anti-Federalist people like Patrick Henry, George Mason, and George Clinton, governor of uh, New York. Patrick Henry is probably the one you're most likely to have remembered. Now, there are some big <laughs> differences uh, between these two sides, and we're going to kind of sum them up, and I've already started to help you see it. But there are three big issues that separate the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. And the first up is representation, right? Anti-Federalists wanted, as we said, government to be close to the people, possessing the knowledge of their circumstances and their wants. And to achieve that end, it was necessary to have small governmental units. In other words, 
close to the people. So another way of kind of saying this is that Federalists wanted the people to be they wanted they anti federalists wanted government to be close to the people in two ways. They wanted it to be close demographically and they wanted them to be close geographically. What this means is, is that the people who govern you should look like you. They should have the kind of same religious preferences as you. They should be like your neighbor. They should be like you. But they also need to be close to you in the sense that you can walk down the street and, and complain to them if something goes wrong, right? So imagine, for instance, we have an issue with government. If it's something going on with Daytona Beaches, city government, right? We could just walk down from Daytona State. We could walk down ISB down to the, the building. I mean, it can be a little hot in the summer, but and there you are, right? Um, but if we all have an issue with something that's happening at the national level, you know, we'd have to take time off work. We'd have to drive a long way or we'd have to buy plane tickets, right? They're not particularly close. We can't just show up easily. So for representation, the anti-federalists wanted people very, very close. Federalists, on the other hand, for uh, representation said, no, you want it kind of far away because you want people who are looking out for the long-term interest. And that's only going to be ha it's only going to happen if these people have a level of separation from uh, from the people. Now the second thing comes from this idea of the threats posed by the majority, and we already said that all the framers kind of thought, eh, you don't want majorities exactly. Uh, we don't want democracy. As a matter of fact, it was one of the six uh, principles that come out of the Constitution in an earlier mini lecture. Um, but. The Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, they're both worried about tyranny, so don't, get, don't think wrongly about that. But what, rather what made them different is how they saw tyrants as likely emerging, right? And so, as a matter of fact, the threats posed by a majority kind of feed into this governmental power question. So what Anti-Federalists thought was likely is that governments would slowly but surely concentrate power. And that the purpose of government, or governmental structures, was to try to prevent this from happening. And one of the ways you did this is by appealing to the populace. Federalists, on the other hand, thought that government would fundamentally result in anarchy. In other words, it would lose power slowly over time. And so the goal was to give the center government enough power so that it could hold its own. And so as a result, you did not want to appeal to the majority ever. So anti-federalists want lots of barriers against governmental power, and federalists are going to want very minimal uh, uh, decisions for power. As a matter of fact, you want to strengthen the national government. Federalists wanted long-term individuals to be controlled, and anti-federalists were more interested in having people who were demographically and geographically uh, like themselves. So, the Constitution will eventually get passed. Here's the end of the story. Federalists will end up beating out the anti-federalists. But they're only able to do it because they make a big promise. And what they promise is, is that they're going to pass some restrictions on the federal government not found in the Constitution. What they're going to agree to write is the first ten amendments, or what we call the Bill of Rights. It's not going to happen easily, but that's what the promise will be, and that's what's going to make it happen. Which means that the last thing that we're going to need to look at, and that's what we're going to do in this section, is take a look at how you pass amendments. So the question then of how to pass amendments becomes a really big deal. And this is the last part of the Constitution that we're going to take a look at. And that is Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, or what ends up becoming the U.S. Constitution. And... Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution provides for four separate methods for changing and altering the Constitution itself. And we're just going to look at each of these briefly, because as a matter of fact, there's not really that different methods. 
um, even though there's four. It's kind of a rearrangement of them. And we'll see that all of them always have two steps. So every method has a step one and a step two. And these will kind of change and intersect depending on the method you're in. Step one for the first method has a passage in the House and the Senate by a two-thirds vote. And this is the proposal phase. So step one is always going to be our proposal. And then step two is always the ratification process, which is going to differ. In method one, the ratification process is such that you need a majority vote in the legislatures of three-fourths of the states. Method two, the first part remains the same, passage in the House and the Senate by a two-thirds vote for proposal. Um, but step two is, the, is a different. In this way, it goes around existing state institutions, and ratification comes through conventions called for that purpose in three-fourths of the states, which is going to be different from um, state legislatures. Method three is going to be a proposal And this time, it's going to, this is going to be the bypass. Instead of being happening in the House and the Senate, it's going to come from a national convention called for that purpose. As a matter of fact, this national convention could do whatever it wanted to do. This has never happened before. In this method, uh, the ratification, we go back to the one we remembered in step one, three-fourths of the states. So the proposal becomes a national convention, and the ratification becomes three-fourths of the states. The final method... It's a national convention, again, just like in method three, only this time we go to method two for the uh, ratification process, where it goes to conventions in three-fourths of the states. Method four, as a result, is unique, because it's, it it's a method that completely bypasses existing government. Now, the only method that has actually ever been used is method one. All of the constitutional uh, amendments that we have today have all gone through method one. And I think we've actually gone over a little bit over my time budget uh, for this mini lecture, so I apologize for that. But next time we'll be coming back and we'll be starting our next section where we're going to start going through each of the uh, major institutions in American government.